So when I was uh, becoming Catholic, one of my questions was, how come Catholics baptize infants? As a Bible-believing evangelicals, uh, it was assumed you only baptize adults. Uh, even though the Bible didn't implicitly say you've got to baptize adults, uh, you just kind of knew it. Uh, the word baptism was taught that it meant to be submerged, and you don't submerge an infant, and, and you have to be an adult to, know, to choose baptism. Um, so I did. I started doing my research. Uh, first thing I went to was a uh, evangelical Protestant historian, J. and D. Kelly, early uh, Christian doctrines. This is a uh, very good church historian, respected by all sides, uh, and he basically says as far back as church history goes, first century they were baptized in infants. So I went further. Um, and I had just learned about the councils of the church. And I'm going to get to scripture. I know the, the title is uh, Infant Baptism in Scripture. I'm going to show you those. But I just want to tell you how I got to this place. So I had just recently, you know, when I was learning about infant baptism, discovered the church councils that decided which books would be in the Bible. That was very enlightening. I shared that on a couple of videos. Um, but basically, the church, the Catholic church, the only church there was at the time, at the councils of uh, Rome in 382, the council of Hippo 386, and the council of Carthage decided which books would be in the Bible, okay? So the council of Carthage was 397, but then they had another one in 419, which basically said the same thing as the first council of Carthage in three, or the council of Carthage 397, because there was other ones even before that. But basically, all these councils were just reaffirming what the church believes and, you know, putting it in writing so all the churches could read it. And very interesting, I have, you, can, you can Google, if you Google the other councils, I haven't been able to find, like, the lists, but somehow they have preserved the actual list of the canons from the Council of Carthage in 419. And when I say canon, uh, generally as an evangelical, you think canon of scripture. What's scriptural, you know? The, you know, we'll just stick with the New Testament for now because uh, Martin Luther changed the Old Testament on us. But the 27 books of the New Testament that Protestants and Catholics believe are canon, we believe they're inspired by God. There was other books by godly men at the time that the church decided not to. And how did they decide? It was church councils, okay? And they prayed. And if you don't know what a church council is, in the Bible, in the book of Acts 15, that was our first church council. But the church has had many more after that. That was just the first one. You can look that up, Acts 15. But in, in the list of canons, I believe it's canon number 24. I got to, yeah, canon number 24. Like it shows you, I don't know if you can see that. It shows you all the numbers. Canon number 24 actually shows you the list of the Bible, the books that should be in the Bible. Pretty, so evangelicals trust that. But if you scroll down in the same meeting, the same Christians praying, being led by the same Holy Spirit, uh, started talking about infant baptism. And all my research showing, historically, the only argument was, should you baptize an infant immediately when they're born, or should you wait eight days like they did with circumcision? That was the only argument. That was the only argument for centuries. Okay, so this is 419 AD, okay? And this is what the church felt the Holy Spirit was telling them. And this is what the church believed. Okay, these are all the leaders of the church, all the bishops in the church. Like Canon 110. Likewise, it seemed good that whoever denies that infants newly from their mother's womb should be baptized or says that baptism is for remissions of sins, but they derive from Adam no original sin, which needs to be removed by the lever of regeneration from whence the conclusion follows. Then in them the form of baptism for remissions of sins is to be understood as false and not true. Let him be anathema. So, he's saying two things there. Uh, children straight from the womb should be baptized. And if you're saying that because the children didn't commit any sin, there's no sin, uh, you're wrong because we have Adam's original sin. And even evangelicals believe that we're born with original sin. Even, you know, there's sins we commit and then there's the original sin. It's in our DNA. It's in our genetics. Okay, from Adam. So they're saying that baptism washes that away. And if you've seen my last video, Born Again, the Bible way, I showed you in the Bible that uh, uh, baptism is what saves us. Uh, 
1 Peter 3.18, baptism now saves us, okay? So it's not just symbolic like so many uh, evangelicals believe today. You know, this is a, that's a recent teaching, very recent, okay? Even Martin Luther did not believe that. And Martin Luther believed in infant baptism. And in fact, the first group of Christians who did not believe in infant baptism were called the Anabaptists, meaning rebaptizers. If you were baptized as an infant, they would rebaptize you. Martin Luther called that a heresy. John Calvin called that a heresy. Zwingli called that a heresy. Okay, all the other reformers during that time said this group is heretical. Don't listen to them. And um, then that same group, the, the Anabaptists, and the reason, the reason they said you, you can't baptize infants is because they took Martin Luther's Bible alone to the next level. Martin Luther said, you know, I'm not going to listen to the Pope. I'm not going to listen to the church. The Bible alone is my only authority. And he lit a fire he couldn't put out because then you had groups coming up saying, well, this is what the Bible means to me. This is what the Bible means to me. And the Anabaptists said, nowhere in it does it say to baptize infants. So we're not baptizing infants. We're rebaptizing adults. Then the Anabaptist says, nowhere in it does it teach the Trinity. Jesus isn't God. So they denied the divinity of Jesus. They denied the Trinity. So they really went off. That's why you never hear of them anymore. They just, their beliefs recirculate. You know, from other little groups, you know, that pop up here and there, like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. But the Anabaptists were the first. And that was 1,500 years after Christ was baptized. So the church all this time. I mean, in fact, um, St. Uh, Cyprian, uh, at the, uh, the Council of Carthage. I'm sorry, there's so many years and numbers. And I've been doing so much today, I'm losing track. Okay, so the Council of Carthage... I believe it was 251. I'm trying to get my years straight. I, I think I have it in here. But 200 years prior to that, 20 years prior to that, let me see. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is a, another. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm using my phone and I'm getting calls. <laughs> so this is another Council of Carthage. Now, Carthage is a. Is a city in uh, Africa where they were meeting, having these uh, councils. That's uh, why they call it Carthage. That's just the, the place they were meeting. So this is another one, 200 years prior, 253 AD, okay? So, uh, I don't have a list like I do with uh, the one in 419, but St. Cyprian, he was the bishop that oversaw this, and he wrote a letter to the churches explaining what they decided. And one of the things was about baptism. And he says, as to what pertains to the case of infants, you said that they ought not to be baptized within the second or third day after their birth, that the old law of circumcision must be taken into consideration, and that you did not think that one should be baptized and sanctified within the eighth day after his birth. In our council, it seemed to us far otherwise. No one agreed to the course which you thought should be taken. Rather, we all judged that the mercy and grace of God ought to be denied to no man born. Okay, he was writing this to Phidus. I skipped that. My, my eyesight's not the best. But he's writing this letter to Phidus. Okay, another a member of the church. And then St. Cyprian goes on to say, If in the case of the worst sinners and those who formerly sinned much against God, when afterwards they believe the remission of their sins is granted and no one is held back from baptism and grace, how much more then should an infant not be held back? Who having but recently been born, has done no sin, except an infant not be held back, according to Adam. He has contracted the contagion of that old death from his first being born. For this very reason, does he, an infant, approach more easily to receive the remission of sins, because the sins forgiven him are not his own, but of those of another? So he's saying even more so we should be baptized in infants. And again, that's what I was talking about. There was a... Uh, uh, disagreement should they wait till the eighth day like circumcision they, in circumcision you wait till the eighth day and that's how you enter the kingdom of God in the Old Testament enter the kingdom of the God in the New Testament it's clearly taught the church is clearly taught for 2,000 years is through baptism again 1 Peter 3.18 baptism now saves us okay the law used to or you thought it did but it couldn't only Jesus could save us okay so Throughout the church, they always taught infant baptism. And even today, 
This, this was news to me as an evangelical, but 90% of Christians worldwide believe in infant baptism. So you got the Catholic Church, all the Orthodox Churches, all the Anglican Churches, all the Presbyterian Churches, the Lutheran Church, Methodists. Notice the older churches. It wasn't until after the Anabaptists that some churches started thinking that way. So this is a tradition of men. This isn't biblical, and this isn't church history. You know, this isn't apostolic teaching. This is, this is teachings of other men, okay, that weren't apostles. The, the men I mentioned, like Cyprian, was 200 years away from Christ. And then you even go further back, uh, St. Irenaeus of Lyons, okay, so who was St. Irenaeus, okay? He was taught by St. Polycarp, who was taught by the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John. And talked about baptism, okay? So, I think these guys know better than these Anabaptists, okay? So, um, St. Irenaeus of Lyons, this is what he says about baptism in an infant. For he came to save us all through himself. All, I say, who through him are born again to God. That's what they taught. When you were baptized, you were born again. Uh, this new way of, you know... Asking the Lord Jesus in your heart and you'll be saved and you're born again. That's, that's a new teaching. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, ask the Lord Jesus in your heart and you'll be saved. So be, repent and be baptized and you'll be saved. Okay, that's scriptural. Okay, so anyway, all I say who through him are born again to God, infants and children and boys and youths and old men. And Naaman dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. It was not for nothing that Naaman, when suffering from leprosy, was purified upon being baptized, but as an indication to us, for as we are lepers in sin, we are made clean of our old transgressions by means of the sacred water and the invocation of the Lord. We are spiritually regenerated as newborn babes, even as the Lord has declared, except a man be born again through water and the spirit, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that's, that's going back, that's the second century. Okay, so you can go back even further to the... Uh, the diadec. That was a, a, a document the church believed. It, they used it like kind of like a catechism. Nobody's sh sure now who wrote it, but we do know the church used it. You know, church historians, whether evangelical or Catholic, will tell you this was like a catechism, like a Sunday school lesson, uh, basically a teaching for the church. And then the diadec, really, I mean, this is some cool stuff. This is, um, you know, you used to have to go to museums and, and buy expensive books to get this stuff. Now everything's online and, and People have put them in books. It's easy. You know, so much information out there. You can see uh, the truth so easily now. But um, the Diadec, historians date it to 50 AD. 50 AD, that's when the apostles were alive. And it was called the teaching of the 12 apostles. Not meaning the 12 apostles wrote it, but it means this is what they were teaching the church. Okay? And they had no printing presses there. Mostly what they taught was taught by apostolic tradition, by word of mouth, they passed it on. And they wrote letters, but n nobody had the means to, to uh, the money-wise, to, to put it all in the Bible. This, there was no printing presses. So these writings uh, were, were sacred to them. They held on to these tight, you know, and they taught. So and this is what they teach concerning uh, baptism. Now, and this, again, this may seem like uh, it's in favor of adult baptism, but they're just giving specifics, okay? They're, they're breaking it down, they're saying, okay, you can do it this way, you can do it that way, because nowhere in the, in the New Testament does it really tell you how to do it. It just says, be baptized. So they break it down. And concerning baptism, baptize this way, having said first all these things, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in living water, like a river or, you know, water outside. Living water, they called it. But if you have not living water, baptize into other water. If you cannot in cold, and I want you to be baptized in cold water, do it in warm. But if you have eat neither, pour out water thrice, three times, upon the head in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But before the baptizing, let the baptized or fast and the baptized and whatever others can. But you shall order the baptized to fast one or two days before. So what he's saying is, listen, if you could baptize outside, in the river, which I'm sure you, you, you dunk them, do it. But if you can't, it's all right, no big deal. Just pour the water on their head. So the, the idea is baptism, water. It's not how, you, you know, they're not that hung up on how you do it, is what I'm saying. So when the church got so big and they were meeting in buildings, in cities, they adopted the sprinkling on the water. 
but there's still some churches that will baptize in rivers if they're near a river or an ocean. So, um, anyway, so this is history. This is, this is there, but now I'm going to get to the scriptures, okay? So, if you want, you can turn to me to Acts chapter 16, verses 14 and 15. Okay, Acts 16, 14 and 15. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Tytira, a, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to listen to what was said by Paul. And when she was baptized with her household, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. Okay, her household, her whole house, it didn't say the adults in the household, it didn't say Lydia, it said her whole household. Okay, then we can turn to Acts 16.29. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. Acts 16.29. And he called for lice and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Men, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once with all his family. So his whole family was baptized. Okay. And he had, you got to believe. Believe and be baptized. That's what he believed. And then he was baptized. It's faith and works. It's not one or the other. It goes together. Okay. And not works of the law, lest any man should boast. So, now 1 Corinthians Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16. Paul's explaining who he baptized. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. So, they were in the habit of baptizing households, okay? And households had infants. Households had children. Households had older people. Generations lived together. Three generations would live together back then. And they would baptize a whole household, Okay. And you remember the story from Luke where the children are running to Jesus and they try to stop it. And Jesus said, no, do not forbid the little children to come to me for the kingdom of God is made for these. If you can't be like a little child, then you can't enter the kingdom of God. So if Jesus felt that way about little children, you don't think he would want them baptized? And the church understood that as baptizing babies. The church understood that. For 1,500 years until the Anabaptists came up with this uh, idea that no infants should be baptized. So, infant baptism goes back to the apostles, goes back to Jesus. Credo baptism, what they call it, the theological term for baptizing only adults, goes back to the Anabaptists, a cult that didn't even believe Jesus was God. So, there are your choices. Believe the teachings of Jesus and the Apostles and the Bible, or believe the teachings of the Anabaptists. So, God bless. I hope this was helpful. For more on baptism, watch my video, Born Again the Bible Way. God bless.